just share. I'm, and I don't plan to take too long. Hopefully, I pray I can say what needs to be said in a shorter amount of time than I have sometimes done. And uh, so I want to talk today about the perfume of repentance. And I, I don't know, just... This is a, it's on the back of a napkin, so this is what they call the back of a napkin message. And this just came to me today while I was praying. I actually wasn't planning on doing a message, but then I just felt like the Father shared this with me and said, I want you to share this, so that's what I'm going to do. And uh, I just, I, I think one thing the Father's been speaking to me about is my need for repentance. You know, like, and when I think about that, it's like, for not being who I know I'm supposed to be in Him, for not, uh, it's been really challenging. I've been hungrier for Him lately than I have in quite a while. And as I've been just seeking Him more than my wife and I, we've been looking at some different things. I We uh, looked at the... Um, what's it called, the Zuzu Street Revival, the, like, watch a documentary on that, and the Zuzu Street Revival is maybe one of the most powerful revivals there's ever been, it's really amazing, who's familiar with the Zuzu Street Revival, anybody know much about it, Ron will know about it, I guarantee you, he knows, he knows, a little bit. he knows quite a bit about it, I'm sure, but the Azusa Street Revival happened back in 1906, and uh, right at the t- turn of the century, I think it was actually on January 1st, 1901, there was a, uh, a group of people that were praying and praying for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And this is at a place where tongues was no longer, uh, it, it had kind of gone dormant in the, in the body of Christ. And so people were not speaking tongues. It was not known. It was something that people might have had a rare experience of and they kept it to themselves because it wasn't practiced in church and so when people would experience that they would just keep that under a hat you know so it was not commonplace and so back in 1901 you know a lot of people read about it in the book of acts but they hadn't experienced it and they were hungry for more of god and they were all in this house and i'll try to make a long story short um through seeking god the holy spirit was poured out And uh, somebody in the house received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which we find scripturally, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is accompanied by speaking in tongues. And then we go to Acts chapter 2, verse 4, and it says that um, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all gathered together in one accord, and um, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, it talks about, it says in Acts 2, 4, and they all spoke in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And so we saw that it was something that all of the people that received the immersion in the Holy Spirit received also this, um, the evidence of, of tongues. And so that was, and I would say this is there is always a physical, um, seeable evidence of tongues. But anyway, that's beside the point of where I'm going with this. So, as, um, in, in 1906, there was uh, Brother Seymour. It was, a, it was an African-American church, so it was an all-black church. And they were seeking for more of God. And this guy Seymour, a lot of people said, was like the humblest man they'd ever met. He was a really amazing man, um, African-American. And he began to pray. He, he came in for the sake of trying to share. And as he came and shared... Uh, was praying every single day, and his prayer went into hours a day, and then after a point, certain point in time, it increased to about seven hours a day. So the guy was really a powerful prayer warrior, and they had they had an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and it was from that Azusa Street revival where that went throughout the whole world. Like that's where Pentecost, that's where all the Pentecostal denominations today came from Azusa Street, and so now like with, uh, I think was it like uh, I can't remember the numbers, but it's just you know millions of people that are out there that have the gifts of the Spirit. It all started at a time where um, those things had gone dormant and, and they came back. But I was just thinking about how 
you know, who Brother Seymour was. And he was a man who was very humble before God. He was a man, who, there was, you know, and it's, it's interesting because, you know, before this happened, he was in obscurity. But he was just a man who was hungry for more of God. And God brings him to a place where he, his hunger becomes profound. And as his hunger becomes profound, we see an amazing outpouring of the Holy Spirit. People came from all over the world. There was so many noted miracles. And uh, one of the noted things that was happening was being baptized in the Holy Spirit. As the return of the baptism in the Holy Spirit became more commonplace within the body of Messiah, and along with that was also amazing power that was happening in signs and wonders, and, and that spread worldwide from a, um, a little black church. And uh, that they had uh, for, I think, was it six years? Three years? Six years? I can't remember. The, they had services that went on every single day that never ended. They had a service that never ended for, like, I think it was three years. Wow. And so people were <laughs> constantly coming from all over. Wow and praying, receiving the baptism of the Spirit. Um, we've talked about Smith Wigglesworth, and, you know, what happened with him, and it's interesting, because he had never preached. His wife used to preach, and he didn't preach, and he had never, she always wanted him to, but he never would, although he did um, pray for souls and was uh, very earnest for winning souls. He, he was um, shy to preach. Until he received the baptism in the Holy Spirit, there was a, a day in which he received the Spirit, and that was the first time he preached. And so he got up and preached, and his wife says, that, that's not my Smith. <laughs> you know, Lord, that's, that's not my Smith. <laughs> that's a different, that's somebody else. But he received power as he spoke in tongues and received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And we, it's something that, you know, the body of Messiah, we, it's really not received enough, enough emphasis and, but those kind of things are always preceded by repentance. Um, then I, you know, I looked at Finney. Like Finney, when he was converted, the day he was converted, he was immediately out winning souls. The reality is, it's like I look at my life and it's like, Father, I'm not a soul winner. I'm not winning souls. Some of these guys, right from the get-go, right out the gate, were doing mighty things for Yah, like right after their conversion. And then there's other men who had, maybe they weren't doing these things, but then they had a, a profound encounter with the Most High that forever changed who they were right. and the things that they could do and that, they, that God could do through them. And... And it's just, all it's done is just make me think of how insufficient I am, you know, as I've been looking at what other people have done. And I, you know, as I find myself, I'm, I'm approaching 50. It seems crazy to think. But it's like, what if I live my whole life and I just waste my life? Because I didn't answer what you has for me. And then, you know, as I think, I think, you know, there was nothing extraordinary about these men. Right. The only extraordinary is God, but what was extraordinary was their profound hunger for God. And, you know, and, and honestly, like, as I've thought about it, it's not because I want to do great things. That's not what I want. But I want, I want to see revival. Like, I'm so hungry for revival. I, I really want to see the hand of God move. And he's given me a desire for souls lately that I've been praying for souls and, and loving, having a compassion for the lost in a way that I haven't experienced. And so it's, you know, I'm just being honest as I've thought about, I've never been a good evangelist. Like I actually do better to speak to a group, but I'm not a good one-on-one -on -one evangelist. I lament over that. But there's a part of me on the inside that thinks, you know, well, what if I receive a compassion and love for the lost like I've never had before in my life? Maybe I could become an evangelist because I want to be, I want to be doing stuff for the kingdom. You know, and it's been hitting me here lately how uh, everything that we are going to do in the kingdom in heaven 
we can do here. But there's one thing we can do here that we'll never get to do there. And that's win the loss. It's the one thing that I can do that I could offer to him. You know, and, and so I look at what different people that have been used greatly of God, both in past generations and even in our last generation or this, you know, like Keith Green. He was an extraordinary guy, not because of his musical talent. He had musical talent, but there's something that separates him, in my mind, from every other um, musician or singer in this day. I don't think there's anybody like the guy. And uh, I remember hearing a testimony about a guy who uh, was listening to some Keith Green, and this guy was a very talented musician, very talented with uh, music and singing. And he was sitting there, and in the pride of his heart, his own testimony, is he said to, to the Father, I could do everything that Keith Green does. <laughs> and, and the Father spoke to him back and said, I would take one Keith Green over a thousand of you any day. That's that man's testimony. I would take one Keith Green over a thousand of you any day. But I thought about what was it about Keith Green. And the amazing thing about Keith Green, would you turn the volume up just a little bit? Is his love for souls. Now, a lot of people don't realize this isn't something that every musical artist does, a Christian artist does, but he started, that goes to this day, a, a missionary organization. One of the things that Keith Green did was... Um, bring a message. He would sometimes have a concert and he would just end up preaching to them. People would get mad and want their money back. But he would just, you know, one of his songs, Jesus Commands Us to Go. Um, his heart was for missions. His heart was for the lost. Um, he, one of his songs was how the church is asleep in the light um, while people are going to hell. And so, you know, when I think of that about that I think of like what was it about Keith Green that was so special to God right. something was special to God about Keith Green and I believe is that he carried something that was so close to the heart of God which was the lost see we can't ever think that we're close with God because we don't murder okay we can't think that we're close to God because we keep the Sabbath we can't think that we're close to God because of our dietary things that we follow. We can't think that we're close to God um, because of going through the motions. Because really being close to God it comes to a place of being after his own heart. Remember what he said about David. I found David, the son of Jesse, a man that is like my heart. He says he was a man like my heart. I believe Keith Green was a man like the heart of God, in that he shared the desire for the lost. And one thing that God spoke to me the other day in my own prayer closet was he just, I woke up in the morning actually, and he says, imagine what it feels like to know that you're never going to see somebody you love ever again. And it's the last time you'll ever see them and they're forever lost to you. You'll never get to talk to them. You never get to watch them. You never get to sh cherish that person. And then he spoke to me, and that's what I go through every day. And I want you to share this with me. I want you to share this love and this desire. And so, I don't know, I guess I said all that to say that I notice, I realize that there's a great lack in me. There's a great lack in me. I'm so it's so blatant to me right now. Like how I lack. I don't I don't I like I read about Smith Wigglesworth, the guy, he says he never went a half hour without praying. Or reading the word. And, or reading the word. The guy always had a Bible with him. What's wrong with me? You know, that's how I have to feel about it is, okay, well, Father, maybe I could just start with telling you I don't love you enough. I don't hunger for you enough. There was a time where I was that hungry for Yah, and I was doing that. 
And God was doing things in my life, but I'm not there anymore. And he's just shown me my pride, my lust, my, uh, you know, just repentance that I need in my life. He's shown me my hard heart. You know, like we, we I, I know, I can say for myself, you know, I, I, I purpose in my heart that I'm going to go after him more and I'm going to pray more. And then I just find myself falling out of what I really want in life. And so sometimes we can kind of lose hope because we're like, you know, he's calling us to a different life. But that's where I'm at is he's speaking to me about a transformation. It's like, Father, is it possible that I could have this, an encounter with you so strong that it'll forever change the course of my life? And that I could actually live for you and be like some of these guys were. Why can't I have that? And it's like, and it's not because you want to do great things for Yah. It's because their love was profound for Yah. You know, it just ends up being you just love him so much that you you, you just don't want to do anything without him. Yeah, and you love people. And you love people. And you want them to know him. God spoke to me one day, and he, everybody knows me knows I love to study the Word. I am, man, I, I've always loved the Word. And he spoke to me one day and said, I want you to be as interested in people as you are in my Word. He was rebuking me. And it made me laugh, because I thought that's not possible. Because I love His Word. It, it actually seemed like, and I was like, you want me to be interested in people that much? <laughs> you know, it was like, wow. It, like, I can't tell you how it affected me. It's just like, wow. But he's like, that's what I want you to do. I want you to love people. What does it matter if you sit around reading a book? But you don't love people because you're never closer to God's heart than when you're loving people. That's what made these people so special. Right? They shared the heart of God. So... Yeah. I'm praying for um, to be born again. Again, I'm praying to have an encounter with God. I feel like I need to be born again. Oh, yeah. I feel like I need one of those experiences where I cross the river Jabbok, Jabbok yeah. which means he empties yeah. in Hebrew. And then J there, Jacob wrestled with God all night. Oh, and there he was thrown out of joint. He never walked the same again. There was a humility that was unlike what he had before. He didn't walk with the same proud strut that he did before. He had been humbled as he spent a night wrestling with God. And it, I just cried out to the Father, I have nothing, I am nothing. But I long to live a life of faith. I long to live a life that makes a difference. I don't want my life to be consumed with nothing. I long for revival in a way I can't describe to people. I, I long for it in a way that I don't want to live if I can't see it. I would, I would die right now if I knew I can't have revival and see it. I was talking to Ron the other day. I called him up. I'm like, Ron, I had just been watching that documentary about... Um, the Zuzu Street Revival, and it's like, man, these men, you know, they just got hungry for God. They got so hungry, they knew they needed Him, and they were going to give themselves over to just believe that they could see it happen. And it's like, Ron, there's nothing that separates that you and me can't be the ones that decide that we're going to pray and we're going to see God until the greatest revival that's ever happened in the history of the world. And that could be us. And not because we're anything. See, I don't think, but I believe that God is always looking for someone that will just stand in the gap. He says, I just looked for one man that would stand in the gap. And I found no one. And so it's like, well, Father, it's a good thing you're not looking for somebody special. Because I'm nobody special. And I feel like such a failure. But something inside me tells me that if I would just come to a place of deeper repentance 
If I would just come to a place of deeper hunger, if I would come to a place of deeper humility, if I would commit myself to prayer until revival comes. See, because I believe that I can pray until revival comes. I believe that. I know it. I know that if I pray, revival will come. And I'm not just talking about any revival, but I mean the biggest revival that this world has ever seen, not because we're anybody, but because God's going to do it. Because He's going to do a last day's great work in the body of Messiah. And it is not happening today because nobody stood, stood up and is really willing to pay the price for revival. But I hear the call that says, will you pay the price for revival? And it's like sometimes we feel like we've gone too far or I've messed up too badly. Have you ever felt that way? You're just like, man, I missed my chance. I've already missed the bus and it's driving down the road and there's no hope for me anymore. And God gave me a scripture this morning in Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 25. And it was, it was Israel, and, he, and Jeremiah 2 is where he's calling Israel to repentance. And they'd already gone a long way from him. And I want to read this because, you know, it encourages me. And then I want to talk about some examples of repentance and what happened after repentance in Scripture. And that's where I'm going to go. So let's go to Jeremiah chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, otherwise you can just follow along. But this scripture is, is interesting to me because God is giving Israel, Judah, an encouragement. And he says, withhold your foot from being unshod. In other words, have your shoes on and be ready, right? And, and withhold your foot from being unshod and your throat from thirst, okay? And you said, there is no hope, for I have loved strangers and after them I will go. See, Israel and Judah has shame. Israel and Judah says, I've already gone after other gods. I've already loved other lovers. And she said, there's no hope. See, God was speaking to her and saying, don't take your shoes off your feet. Don't go thirsty. You can have what you need from me. But she said, there's no hope. I've gone too far. Let's look at another example in the book of Luke. Where was that, Jeremiah? Jeremiah 2, 25. 25. Jeremiah 15 is interesting because he, there, the, it starts with the Pharisees and scribes are murmuring because it says that this man eats with sinners. This man calls sinners. This man chose sinners to turn the world upside down, right? In the, in the eyes of everybody in the world, they can be disqualified. How have you ever felt like I'm disqualified? I have felt that feeling. I've felt like I've failed in so much I could never be used with what he's called me to do. I've said, there's no hope. Right? But we go into, as we go into Luke 15, it says, A certain man, verse 11, had two sons. And the younger said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. And he divided to them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, and he took a journey into a far country, and there he wasted his substance with riotous living. And so that's a story of many people, right? The prodigal son, he had inheritance. He had what God gave to him. How many people have felt like they have you know, sold their inheritance or they wasted their inheritance? Right? Because if the call is only for the good and the perfect and those that have never failed, then what, what hope do we have? So I hope this is an encouragement. You know, I don't know, I just preach like I'm preaching to a thousand people because it's just, is it doesn't matter if one person can get a hold of the message and be all that God's called them to be. It can change the course for millions of people. You guys know the story, right? He took what was his father's and he, he drug his father's name through the mud and he left his father and he had spent it on prostitutes, right? He, 
he found himself working in a pig farm, which Jews hated pigs, right? It was unclean. With the smell of pig on him, seemingly uh, disqualified to even be his son. And we read that he says he comes back to his father. First of all, he goes through uh, the dissatisfaction of sin. He goes through the ravages of sin. He gets to feel the emptiness of sin. He gets to see what happens when you go against the word of God. And he ends up in a great famine, wishing that he could have even what his, the servants in his father's house had. And he says, I don't know what else to do. I'll just go back and say to my father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. I weep because I feel repentance. And you know why we don't have revival and we don't have a harvest? It's because we're in a drought of tears. Because every single time when I read about true revival happening in Scripture, it's, it's accompanied by weeping. And people in the church today aren't even used to weeping. We don't even know what it's like. We've rarely seen it in our lives. And we're in a famine and a drought like the prodigal son was. Let me just be like one of your hired servants. And so he arose and he went. And when, his, when he was a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion on him. And his father ran. It's the only time that God ever ran is when he ran to his prodigal son who had sinned and come in repentance. And this is what really strikes me is because we can be living as, quote, unquote, a righteous life. And hearing me, like, walking in commandments, walking and doing daily what we feel. We know we're not out, uh, you know, carjacking or, you know, pulling knives on people or, or you know, gang banging or whatever. We're just, you know, we're not we're not out selling drugs. We're we're doing the right thing. And what we find ourselves are often is like the, the you guys know the story, I don't need to read the whole thing, that the older brother as he sits back and then the father says, Get the best robe and put it on my son and put my ring on his finger and kill the fatted calf and let's have a party. And then the older brother who had seemingly been walking righteous, right, he had stayed in his father's house, says, you never so much as killed a calf for me. You didn't have a party for me. But what is it about my brother that all of a sudden he gets everything that I want from you? And I asked the father this morning, why is it? What is it? And he spoke to me because there is never anything so beautiful as when I look into the heart of one in the midst of repentance. You, you could be walking in your spiritual pride, but you don't look beautiful to him. But there's something about a broken and a contrite heart that's so beautiful to the Father. It's a perfume that arises before his nose. When he smells repentance, when he smells forgiveness, it's beautiful to him. And, you know, I've, ne I've never really understood this. I've seen times, you know, when we look at great revivals, you study revivals, the, the church can be going along its merry way, merrily way, just, you know, day in and day out, day out. Not a lot of excitement, not a lot of hunger, but they're, you know, but they're walking as believers, quote unquote. But then all of a sudden there's a repentance that takes place or somebody will repent of their hypocrisy or some town drunk gets, gets born again. And all of a sudden the Holy Spirit gets poured out. And the Holy Spirit gets poured out in the moment of repentance and not in the continuance of commandment keeping. Why? Have you ever thought of it? What is it about repentance? Let me tell you something, and I'm not going to read all the scriptures, but Hezekiah was a, a son of a very wicked king. 
Ahaz, son of a very wicked man. But I love what it says in 2 Chronicles chapter 29, because it says that when Ahaz, or Hezekiah, when his father died, Hezekiah came in, and in the first year of his reign, in the first month, in the first day, he commands that they restore the worship of God. In other words, he had been sitting, seeing Israel in sin. Israel, Ahaz made Israel to sin in a way that we can't even fathom. They're burning their sons and daughters to Molech. Burnt, they are involved in such great wickedness. Why would this wicked people get such an outpouring of the Holy Spirit from God? We see other days when the, the righteous Israel, they're walking and not doing all these terrible things. But there's something about the moment of repentance that provokes an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I know I'm emotional. I don't mean to be, and I can't help it. But I, I know that <laughs> as I've been even reading this, studying on this this morning, as God was speaking to me, you know, Hezekiah was waiting. Man, I recognize my daddy. <laughs> He's got sin. I recognize He's not walking with Yah, but I know what I'm going to do when I come into power. I know what I'm going to do. And he repents corporately for his father's sins, for the sins of Israel. And he says, it's in my heart to make a covenant before the Lord God of Israel that we should walk in his ways. And Israel goes through repentance. And we have recorded in Chronicles of Hezekiah, a national revival that takes place, and it says they have, they held the feast of Passover. They hadn't been holding it, and they rejoice, and then they do it for another seven days, because seven days wasn't enough. And there was so much joy. And, they, and God was moving in such a way. We see the same thing in Nehemiah, right? And they're brought back to Israel, and the Israel begins to sin, and they begin to do things wrong, and, and, and Hezekiah is what they call the Tershatha, and he sees what's going on, and he's plucking his beard, and he starts smiting them on the head, and he's like, what are you guys doing? This is what God has kicked out of the land in the first place. And they take and they read the, the law of God. And it says that as they began to read the law of God, the people began to weep. And he, he says, this, he's like, hey, this is supposed to be a feast day, but everybody's weeping. There was corporate repentance taking place. And he, that's where that famous quote, this day is holy to the Lord. Uh, the joy of the Lord is your strength. And he had to ask them, this, okay, you've had your weeping. You know, weeping endures for a night, but joy comes in the morning. With On the heels of repentance is joy and an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And it's often a move of God that is unlike what you would normally experience in the place of repentance, in the place of wicked repentance. Prodigal son, who is he? Let's look at another example, and I'm almost done, because I don't want to take more time. I only want to speak what he wants me to speak this morning, or afternoon. In, uh, in Luke, or actually we just did the Luke, in Luke 7, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about this woman, Mary. In Luke chapter 7, verse 36. I'm a fool for Messiah. I want to be a fool for him. I'm not who I want to be, but I want to be. I'm I'm wanting a I'm wanting a drastic change in my life. I'm wanting to see the ex, what 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 we'll call the extraordinary, but actually should be the normal. It should actually be the natural. And behold, verse 30, 37, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Yeshua sat at meat at the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment, Imagine your repentance being so precious and special 
in the eyes of God that he's given you a forever memorial in the word of God. How special you must be. Oh, you can start telling me about this woman out of whom Yeshua cast seven demons. You can tell me she was a prostitute. You can tell me she was demon-possessed. But she got a memorial because of the heart. <laughs> they said if he was a prophet, he wouldn't let this happen. He would know what man or woman it is that touches him, for she's a sinner. And Yeshua answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he said, Master, say on. There is a certain creditor which had two debtors, the one of 500 pennies, or day's wages, and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him the most? See, sometimes coming out of the hole and knowing what you've been saved from can provoke so much love and passion for him that maybe somebody doesn't know who hasn't been in the depths of the ditch, right? He haven't been saved out of the gutter. But she knew. Now, not everybody gets that, you know, he doesn't get that response out of everybody, right? But how special it is to him when he does. Let me tell you something, God takes notice. Because of the perfume of repentance is sweet. Matter of fact, he smells that perfume and he's whistling at you, right? Like, I'm telling you, he's attracted to you. Do with that what you want. I'm talking about spiritual attraction. He desires us. He desires us. And there's nothing that makes him desire us like that heart. It doesn't matter where she's been. It doesn't matter what she's done. And I read stuff like this and I know there's hope for me. That I can be close to him and I can be special to him. And it's not because I think I'm somebody special. But I know that there's a place of humility. If I can learn to be a humble man. See, I haven't been the humble man I want to be. It really struck me as I read about Brother Seymour in the Zuzu Street is that everybody spoke of how humble the man was. That, and it says the same thing about Moses, right? And it's like, wow, he resisted the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And I want to be a different man. I want to be a different man if it means I live the rest of my life. If I have nothing I can be proud for. I want to be dependent on him. That was said about Brother Seymour. He wasn't, like, he, the guy was very honest to me. He was not, like, uh, like extra special in preaching. He wasn't eloquent. He was um, partially blind, too, He right? was blind in one eye. Uh, he's a black guy, which, you know, in that day uh, of all, they were looked down on back then, you know, to be honest. He's blind in one eye. They didn't, they didn't even let him. He had to sit outside the classroom and listen from the doorstep because he was black. But he didn't get. But he didn't get mad. He just accepted it happily that he was even able to be taught. And he and they said that he exhibited a a childlike dependence on God at all times. He was very like what seemed to be simple. You would, and yet he was maybe using the greatest revival, you know, past in way past any of the other reformers and Luther and all that. Uh, didn't need a lot of qualifications, but he just walked humbly with God. That's a qualification. That's a qualification. <laughs> right? And so look what Yeshua says about this woman. And I'm going to finish with this woman here. And he turned to the woman and said, Simon, do you see this woman? I entered into your house and you didn't give me any water for my feet. But she's washed my feet with tears. Simon was a righteous man, right? But she's done more. The tears of her head. You gave me no kiss. But this woman, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil you did not anoint. Let me tell you what. He could say this to a lot of men, and it might sound something like, I'll take about one Keith Green over a thousand of you because you haven't done these things. But Keith Green poured the oil on my feet and on my head. 
like and everybody that's ever disused by Yah, they, it's not. You know, as Scripture tells us that Elijah was a man of like passions as we are. In other words, he was like us human beings. He's not. He wasn't some special guy. And the answer is, but at last, is we aren't men of like passion as Elijah was, right? And man, Elijah was a man of like passions as we are, but we don't have the passion he had for Yah. We aren't men of like prayer as he was. It was those things that made it different for people that get used by God. Wherefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, for to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven you. Now this is, begins a interesting relationship of Yeshua with this woman who he loves very much. Um, she was very special to him. You know, it's interesting to me is you guys know who the first person Yeshua revealed himself to after his resurrection? It wasn't the 12 apostles. It was this woman, Mary Magdalene. He appeared first to Mary Magdalene. <laughs> you know? Why? <laughs> There's something beautiful about it. Okay, let's go to another scripture. John 11, verse 2. And then we'll finish here with, with Mary. John 11, 2. Let me get the right book first. Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. And look what verse 2 says. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment, so I'm losing my voice a little bit, and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So now we get to see a little bit more. It says, it was that Mary, right? Okay, that's all I wanted to point out there. Now let's go to uh, John chapter 12. And we see that Yeshua, uh, you know, we know he raised Lazarus from the dead. Let's see, I'm in verse, let's see, let's just start with verse 1, chapter 12. Then Yeshua, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. And there they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. And look what she does again, right? Because now he's going to get, he's going to die and be buried. He says, then took Mary a pound of ointment, a spikenard, very costly. They say that was worth a year's wages, so it would be about thirty to $40,000 worth of oil. And anointed the feet of Yeshua and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment, the perfume of repentance. There's something about of people coming before God. I don't care how many of us there are here or whatever, but when you come before God and there's a broken, you know, you break the alabaster box. There's a breaking, and the alabaster box, I believe, is, you know, representative of the breaking of our humanity, the breaking of this, you know, the flesh, so that the perfume can come forth. The perfume of repentance. The perfume of repentance that made Yeshua show himself first to Mary after resurrection. How special is this prostitute? Don't call her prostitute anymore, though. She's redeemed. Right? She's redeemed. Wherever the gospel's preached, this story's going to be said about her. And then I'll just finish with this one verse. I shared this a couple of weeks ago. Proverbs chapter 1. So I'm just in a place of repentance. I'm not speaking to you guys or anybody listening as one who's arrived. I'm speaking to you as one who needs repentance. One who, in my heart, I see all my failings. I see where I need to change. I see my own ugliness. And I feel desperate inside to be different. 
and I know only he can bring it. But it's already always been, I've loved this verse for so long because he spoke it to me one time. Because I've noticed there's been times in my life where like I just feel like I just turn to him and repent. And I in my heart, I'll feel like, okay, there needs to be this um, uh, time of uh, where I, I'm on probation. And God forbid that he could use me for anything because I've sinned against him. And, and I've noticed like he'll use me or he'll do something or he'll just do something where his presence will come so close to me. And I'll be sitting there going, how could you be so close to me? When I failed you, I just barely just repented to you and told you I'm sorry and I feel your embrace and I don't feel like I deserve it. I don't understand how you could love me. And, and he spoke to me one day. He says, your repentance, Sean, provokes the immediate outpouring of my spirit. And I'm like, Father, can you show me that in the Word? And he took me to Proverbs 1. And it's verse 23. And he said, turn at my rebuke. Repent. Turn. Repent. Turn at my rebuke. Repent when I rebuke you. You know what? Sometimes we need to be rebuked, right? Sometimes we need to see the ugliness of who we let ourselves become. And who, you know what I'm saying. And we can often see it in everybody else but ourselves. But we got to look inward. But it's not a bad thing. There's something about that, taking that initiative to say, I'm going to look and see where I'm at, and I'm going to turn, and I'm going to repent. I'm, I'm going to do, and I need your help. But I know I need to. My repentance has to look like daily neediness on him. Because like you guys probably can testify this as well as I that how many times have we purposed in our heart it's going to be different? How many times have I purposed that I'm going to walk different? I'm going to be in the Word more. And I realize that, the, that really my, my change, if I'm going to encounter Him, I'm going to have to go after Him. And I'm going to have to get alone with Him. And I'm going to have to be transformed. But He says, turn at my reproof, my rebuke. Behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. It's like, there it is, right? The word, repent. Your repentance provokes the immediate outpouring of my spirit. He runs to the prodigal son. He doesn't tell him to go and shower and get that hog smell wiped off of you before you even come into my presence. He throws his arms around his neck and hugs him because he can't smell the hog smell. All he can smell is the perfume of repentance. And if we're going to have true revival come, there's going to have to be a perfume that spills all the house. There's going to have to be a breaking then we will never, ever see revival, a true outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So there's a humility of I'll expose who I am and what a fake I am or whatever my issues are and recognize, and that's what I'm doing here today, is I'm so much less than what I need to be, and I've sinned against Him in so many ways, and I've had so much pride in my heart, and I've let and I'll just confess, I've let lust come into my heart, and I've let um, anger come in my heart, and I've let the way I look at other people not be with love like he loves. And I just want to, I want to just be transparent and not make myself into anything that I know I'm not, and just say, Father, can you change this piece of dirt, this piece of clay because I believe in that humility if we can get to that place that when we're together that this place can be filled with smoke that this place can be filled with perfume and incense and it's going to come in a breaking guys it's going to come in a breaking
Turn at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. And then what does he do? He says, I will make known my words to you. That's the, that's the conclusion of it, right? Turn at my reproof. I'll pour my spirit on you so you can receive my word. And then I'll give you my word. And I'll put in a new heart. I'll take out the heart of stone. You know what? Nobody ever got anywhere. The kings of Israel, any of the men of God, ever got anywhere until they said, I've sinned and my fathers have sinned and I've done wickedly and I'm not going to pretend to be something that I'm not. And I'm just going to confess how short I am and I'm going to stop talking about where everybody else is at or looking at where everybody else is at and I'm just going to confess my sin. Now I've had people tell me, oh, be careful. You don't want to confess your sin because people will take that and you know what they'll do? They'll gossip about you. They'll run you through the mud. It's like, I don't care. Let them run me through whatever they want to run me through. Let them say whatever they want to say about me. But if I can only get his attention through the perfume of repentance, then I don't care what anybody else is going to say, right? It comes down to you just die to self. So anyway, I hope that uh, that blesses you guys. I'm so hungry to have an encounter with him that's going to transform me and to spend time daily with him. And, oh, thank you, Father, thank for you, Father. that I can cry. Thank you that we can be broken and repentant. So I just want to finish your father at prayer. Ask that, you know, in our weakness, you're made strong. I, uh, people can't even handle watching somebody cry while they talk. <laughs> They're so unused to it. But father, I pray that you can take this spool and use me and use this message. If you don't use me, just use the word. I read that when I read about Josiah, Hezekiah, and uh, in Nehemiah and all those instances, I love what it said. This is one thing I forgot to say and I want to share is when Josiah, King Josiah, um, they, in the eighth year of his reign, he started reigning when he was eight years old. And in the eighth year of his reign, he was 16 then. It says he began to set his heart to seek the Lord. And uh, so the immediate thing he does is like, let's get the house of God back in order. Let's clean it out. Let's repair it. It hadn't been being used. It was torn down, you know, dilapidated. And so he gives a command to go get it all swept out and clean. And while, you know, it's interesting because as we make the first step to uh, do what we know to do, um, God gives us more light. And so um, they they find the, the scribe finds the book of the law, but they lost. They had so, this is how far they had fallen. They had so not been following Yah that they didn't even have his word they didn't know where what happened to it we don't even know where the copy of the law is and they they had literally not heard it as you read the the right. what happens there and so the king's like well read it to me and as they read the law of God Josiah weeps he weeps when he hears the word of God we don't have people that will weep at the word, at hear, the hearing of the word of God, right? And so God sent a prophet to Josiah, or Josiah sent to inquire of the prophet. He says, send to the prophet and ask him, what do we do? Because I know that from what just got read to me, I'm paraphrasing, great wrath is on this people because we have sinned with their fathers and the prophet says, this is what you'll say to the man who sent you to me. I want to read it. I want to read it word for word. Second Chronicles 34, 27. And then that'll be it. Second Chronicles 34. Not Corinthians. I'm going to turn to Second Corinthians. <laughs> Second Chronicles, almost there. 34, verse 27. Okay, and this is the prophet talking. And in verse 26, I'll start there. And as for the king of Judah, 
who sent you to inquire of Yahuwah, so shall you say to him, Thus saith Yahuwah Elohim of Israel, concerning the words which you have heard. Because your heart was tender. And this verse moves me. This, ver this verse, I remember when I read this at 16 years old, I wept when I read this verse for the first time. I read this and I'm like, and I was interested because Josiah was 16. But I wept when I read this because your heart was tender. Because I, because I cried out in my heart, God, I want to have a tender heart before your word. Because your heart was tender and you did humble yourself. Right? That's part of repentance. It takes a humbling of yourself before God. You humbled yourself before God when you heard the words against this place and against the inhabitants thereof. And you humbled yourself before me and you did rend your clothes and wept before me. I have even heard you, says Yahweh. That's so special. Isn't that so special? That he says, you humbled yourself and your heart was tender and you wept before me. Therefore, I'm pardoning and you're going to have peace in your day. This judgment's not been falling. Not only that, but they got to experience and they said they had a Passover that was unlike any before or after it. Another revival among the people of God who didn't even have the word. They had so far backslidden. Do you guys see? Are you guys seeing what I'm seeing? Do you see what I see? I see that repentance will bring an outpouring of the Holy Spirit greater than the daily walking that doesn't show hunger. Because in that return of what was lost is a passion and a fire. And God responds to, and that we're never, in that broken place of repentance, there's no putting forth yourself or putting on errors. It's just total transparency. I'm undone. I'm just so lost. I don't know. There's nothing about me that I can give to you to tell you why you should forgive me or why you should love me. And there's something about that place right there that's more beautiful than he ever sees anything in you. And that's what I got this morning, is that I've never seen you so beautiful as I see you right now in this moment of repentance. You said that to me? Yeah. Wow. I mean, I'm. it's more of a thought, of, you know, like I'm just like, putting it in words, but it was, yeah, all that thought. Because awesome. I was asking him, like, what is it? It's mm -hmm. like, there's something about the beauty of that place of repentance. Mm -hmm. That's unlike anything else you ever exhibit. And that he would that our hearts were always in that place. That he would that our hearts were always in that total surrendered place. Because it's, it's greater than the normal of what many people walk as believers. And so, I don't know. Walking humbly with him. Being in repentance. So.